I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. Attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion. I've seen sea beams glitter in the dark near the Tannhauser Gate. All these moments will be lost in time, like tears in rain. Time to die. That's how an epic battle ends on Blade Runner. I apologize. There will be there is going to be spoilers in this episode. The movie came out in eighty two, so what thirty five, almost forty years ago. Hatter, yeah. <laughs> Hi, welcome. Um, that's how Blade Runner pretty much wrapped up. What I'm going to do <laughs> is I'm going to read to you just so people can kind of catch up. I'm going to read to you the opening crawl uh, at the beginning of Blade Runner. Early in the 21st century, the Tyrell Corporation advanced robot evolution into the Nexus phase, a being virtually identical to human, known as a replicant. The Nexus 6 replicants were superior in strength and agility and at least equal in intelligence to the genetic engineers who created them. Re replicants were used off-world as slave labor uh, in hazardous exploration and colonization of other planets. After a bloody mutiny by the Nexus, com Nexus 6 combat team in an off-world colony, off colony, replicants were declared illegal on Earth under the penalty of death. Special police squads, Blade Runner units, uh, had orders to shoot to kill upon detection any trespassing replicants. This was not called execution. This was called retirement. Okay, so that's how Blade Runner begins. Blade Runner has a very interesting history involving the making of the film. Um, I want to say, you know, it's weird because you always say, oh, it's based on a book <laughs> by Philip K. Dick called Do Androids Dream of Electric, Electric Sheep? It's kind of based off of it. It's the general idea of it. Um, you know, the word Android was replaced with replicant. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, that pretty much, it, it, that's about as far as it goes. It was released in 1982, same year as Tron. Um, so I already talked about the events and things that happened in 1982. So we're going to skip that. Well, this, this is going to be a very heavy, just, this is, this is what's happened. This is Blade Runner. Okay. Um, so basically Blade Runner was Ridley Scott's homage to a film noir. Okay. But it, this was science fiction. Okay. So kind of imagine double indemnity and I don't want to say Star Wars, but maybe Star Wars. We'll throw it that way. Double indemnity and Star Wars. That's my best. That's my best thing to compare for Blade Runner. Um, after the success of Alien, so Ridley Scott made Alien, Dino De Laurentiis wanted Ridley Scott to help him out with his Dune project. Now, if you watched my, um, if you watched my episode of The Recovering Col Collector uh, with Twin Peaks, you'll remember about David Lynch being involved in this and of course making uh, Dune. But apparently at some point, Dino De Laurentiis wanted Ridley Scott to do it. Um, after about a year, the, skip, the script still didn't really turn into something that Ridley Scott could film, so he moved on to Blade Runner, okay? Uh, Blade Runner was originally uh, going to be produced by Michael Dealey uh, for Filmways Pictures. So this is when the trouble starts, okay? Uh, Filmways, per okay, so Filmways Pictures uh, was probably best known for its CBS television shows, like uh, let me see. Oh, he's like Mr. Ed, the Beverly Hillbillies, Petticoat Junction, Green Acres, like <laughs> the Adams Family, Cagney and Lacey. This was Filmways Pictures. They also did movies. They also did some movies. The Sandpiper, The Cincinnati Kid. These are, you know, like um, uh, The Fearless Vampire Kill Killers, uh, Roman Polanski, uh, Ice Station Zebra. What was the other one? There was, oh, Brian De Palma's Dress to Kill, Blowout and Death Wish 2. So they've made, they, they've been around the block, you know. But 
basically what happened is Filmways bailed on the $15 million production of Blade Runner a couple more months before principal photography was going to begin. So principal photography is when they start filming the bad boy, okay? So Filmways bailed on it. Michael Dealey, who I mentioned before, was able to bring the film to Burbank's to the Burbank Studios lot <clears throat> with financial backing by the Lad Company, Tandem Productions, and Warner Brothers. Okay. Uh, Scott said that when he came into the project, after the he came into the project after the first draft of the screenplay play has been written, but he did hint that there was probably more drafts of the script uh, before he even came on. Okay, I mentioned before about how it's pretty much nothing like the book. Philip K. Dick's Do, Android Dream, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Uh, the book focused on post-Holocaust uh, yeah, post world where most of the plant's animal life had become extinct. Um, extinct with, and with the widespread, so basically the human population were all left. They pretty much left and they went to off-world colonies. Whereas, yeah, in the movie Blade Runner, there was a lot of replicant animals, but there was, it was more about the overpopulation of the world at that point. Because um, if you remember the film, it was just like tons and tons of people. And, you know, it looks like it's supposed to be basically like if San Francisco to Los Angeles all merged, you know, into one type of city. So the script went through a series of rewrites, uh, Ham Hampton Fancher, and later by David W. Peoples. Uh, with Ridley Scott's primary attention, uh, basically just focusing on the look of the film. So if you watched Alien, or if you've seen any Ridley Scott film, like Legend, all that stuff like that, his attention to detail, for him, it's the whole image. It's not just the actor, it's the background, it's the props, it's the effect. Okay, he, Philip K. Dick, he came from the world of commercials. So everything had to be perfect and precise, and he was not afraid to waste film at all so and we'll get more into that about the issues that caused um he wanted to so in alien so basically before he brings into a production designer he likes to have conceptual illustrations let me see if i said that right um to kind of give you the visual feel of what the film's gonna look like so for alien he brought on hr geiger and uh ron cobb he wanted to do the same thing with blade runner and uh, he bought a book called, I'm trying to remember what it was, called The Sentinel, not The Sentinel, just Sentinel, uh, basically by Sid Meads, it's S-Y-D Mead, I always get his, I always say it wrong. And the book was this exotic, he would do these really exotic projections about vehicles and industrial design, uh, which was grounded in logic, which means as advanced as it was, it was possible to be created, okay? Sounds like Sid. Okay, thank you, Hatter. Sid. Sid Mead. Um, so here, here's a good example. So this is one of the the cars from Blade Runner. It's the police. Uh, it's basically the police one. Um, and so what he did was he started drawing these concepts for these cars, very streamlined. But he took the idea from like a Harrier jet, how a Harrier jet was able to kind of lift off instead of kind of roll on the ground and then take off it would just lift up so he used the idea of that technology to work with the cars he wanted it still to be the size of a car he didn't want like wings that came that open and close it just had to it would just lift off you know so when he was making all these drawings of these cars one of the things that uh sid mead likes to do is he doesn't like just a drawing just kind of floating in nowhere. It needs to be connected to something. So he started to also incorporate things in the background. By doing that, that gave Ridley Scott, that got Ridley Scott's attention. And he put, let him go to the Burbank lot and start sketching on the drawings that were there. And basically what Sid came up with was that, and, and other productions, uh, production uh, people as well, was that you would have the old building but it would be expanded with new with new futuristic parts to it, added on to it. It was kind of like you'd have the outside of the building, but everything inside would be different and expanded outward. Um, so that's where Sid Mead came in. So here you have a director who is very meticulous about 
the whole image. And then you have actors, actors like Harrison Ford, uh, Sean Young. They're there to do their job. They're looking for a director, especially for Harrison Ford. Harrison Ford is very professional, but he likes to have somebody, he likes the director to tell them what he should be doing, you know. Um, and so a lot of times these actors and actresses are just hanging around uh, waiting for something to happen, for a shot to be done. But Ridley Scott is spending all this time just working on the background, making sure the props are all set. So if you come in and like, I'm, I'm trying to remember one of the stories one of the actors said like, um, if you come in at like 6 p.m. to do a shot, to, I mean to shoot all night, and you're there all night, and they're actually not ready to shoot until about 6 a.m., which is prior for the next day, and you have to quickly do your shots, make them perfect before they have to get out of wherever they're at, like Grand Central Station, Union Station, like Union Station in Los Angeles. The police station was Union Station, and they would have to do night shoots there because at 6 a.m., uh, the commuters come in. So here you are, you're an actor, you're trying to do your scene, you're waiting, you're prepared to do your scene, and you're just waiting the whole time until finally, you know, you have a half hour before the commute people on the train show up or trying to get on their trains and you have to do these perfect scenes. Um, the, the, this movie, as you can see, as I mentioned before, Filmways, they left before principal photography happened. There was a lot of movement, a lot of things happening. The script, I feel, the script never became what I think they wanted it to be. When the movie was first released, nobody understood it. Nobody, the, the test audience didn't like it. They just didn't understand what was going on. So basically Ridley Scott, I don't know if it was Ridley Scott or if it's just the producers or somebody from the studio was like, look, we don't know what's going on. You have to add a narration. Uh, you have to cut this down a bit. So that's when you got the narration of Harrison Ford uh, narrating the whole film, which honestly, I didn't hate the narration. The narration was fine. It's just, um, it was just evidence of what the 80s held for moviegoers. Everything had to be blatantly just put right in front of you. You know, in the 60s and 70s, they tried harder to let you use your own, kind of your own thought process on what was going on. Uh, in the 80s, it, a lot of times it had to be just like plain cut and dry, this is what it is. And Blade Runner wasn't that film. Um, so when it came out, nobody liked it. <laughs> That's just the easy way to put it. Nobody liked it. Um, and it just, it was just a huge disappointment. Uh, it's really interesting. A, a couple of books that I have, uh, future noir, the making of blade runner is a really good book. If you can still find it. Uh, I have a reprint of a Cinefix magazine from 1982 that came out. Um, but there's not a lot of information about the making of the film. There's not a lot of stuff left about the film because basically when they were done with the film, they were done with the film. Things just got thrown away. Ridley Scott, Ridley Scott wanted nothing to do with it. Everybody, nobody wanted anything to do with it. Um, to tell like the, the things that happened, like so, so Philip K. Dick, the writer of the book that this movie was based off of, was completely left out, like left out of the loop and found out from the tabloids that his book was going to be made into a movie. So nobody told him the production, nobody told him that this was going to be made into a movie. Um, he sp spoke poorly of the film before it even came out. And honestly, he has a right to be bitter because basically what it was like, he didn't even get to see the first draft of the script. Michael Dealey, who I mentioned before was one of the producers, one of the, Michael Dealey's lawyer, one of his lawyers or something like that gave him a copy of the script. Like, when they when, when production and when the studio found out that he had a copy of the script they were like where did you get it from we want names blah 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 philip k dick he got it legally like i said he got it from one of the producers lawyer one of the producers lawyers um and he read it and he was just like this is not this is not my book this is i this isn't me you know um so already you're upsetting the, and i feel this happens to a lot of books a lot of novels you know which i get uh when they try to make it into i feel well now I feel there's maybe a more of a, a kinship between the writer of the book and the the actual filmmakers uh, that are trying to bring it to the screen. 
But a lot of times it was just like, we just want the property. We gave you money for it. Go away. Um, so you had that. Then you had the fact that, and <sighs> Harrison Ford and Ridley Scott, they never really publicly hated on each other. Uh, they were both really professional about, you know, they're still professional. But on the set, Ridley Scott and Harrison Ford, they didn't get along very well, at, like at all. Um, like I mentioned before, Harrison Ford wanted a director that would focus on him and tell him what he needs to do. And Ridley Scott was just more focused about the big picture and trying to get everything done. To be fair, and also, you know, there's more about Ridley Scott I'll get into soon. Um, but Ridley Scott, I mean, he had, there was, he had a lot of pressure from the studios or way they were over budget. Uh, they were behind. Um, so he had a lot of, you know, a lot of things up in the air. Um, but so Ridley Scott and Harrison Ford, they just, they didn't get jail very well. And you can read certain interviews, uh, especially in this or in like deep old, ma you know, old ma uh, magazines during that time where there'll be people who witness their kind of clashing, you know, like Harrison Ford shouting out to Ridley Scott saying like, what is this? This doesn't make sense. <laughs> kind of a thing. Um, Harrison Ford and Sean Young. Did Harrison Ford did not like Sean Young. Sean Young, maybe Sean Young was really, this was, was kind of new to the business. Um, it's funny, I say in the, there's a line in Blade Runner uh, when she's like, I, you know, <laughs> this, I'm not, you know, this isn't, this isn't part of my job. This isn't the business. I am the business. But she was new to the business. Um, so pretty green. And maybe Harrison Ford didn't like that. I don't know, because here's Harrison Ford, this big actor. And, um, but he didn't like, him and John Young did not, they wouldn't talk at all offset. And it's funny, going through a couple books, the, their love scene, uh, the, the joke on set was that was the hate scene. Because um, they just didn't like each other. <laughs> you know, so, so Sean Young, Harrison Ford, they didn't like each other. Ridley Scott and the film crew. So Ridley Scott uh, is used to, was used to British productions. He, 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 okay, so he made it, did an interview with like a Manchester newspaper about the making, uh, making a film uh, in America and the American crews. And he said that he liked, because when he was in England or working with the British, uh, British uh, crew, they would just say, whatever you need, governor. And that article, <laughs> that interview got out to the end. The American film crew saw that. And they ended up making t-shirts. There was like a huge, there was like a t-shirt war on set. And one of the t-shirts was, whatever you say, governor. Um, but he didn't like how the Americans were always questioning, you know. Uh, he just wanted things done. And uh, American uh, crews, I guess, just questioned him too much. Like I said, there was a, basically, there was a t-shirt war where they'd come up with all these different, you know, like, what was, one of them was like something about it not aliens suck, but something like that, you know, they had all these different types. Of, so this was the only way they could kind of retaliate without being fired, I guess. Um, so it, it, it's just the, the whole idea of the film, like how it, it got made and all the pain and suffering to get this film done. Uh, it's just, it's amazing that it even was produced. Uh, there are many, many different versions of it. I think there's five different versions. I'm saying there's five different versions because there. So this came out, <clears throat> I think 2007. Uh, it's basically like a briefcase with a bunch of cool stuff in it. That's where I got the car. Um, and it's got like five different versions of it. In 2007, they finally released what was called the final cut. There was a work print cut. So when the movie first came out, there was rumors about the film having that there were different versions that there was different director's versions. There was, I remember going to Blockbuster Video and buying the Canadian version of uh, Blade Runner that had no narration, wait, no narration, but the dream sequence with uh, the unicorn. And we'll talk about that more in a bit too. Uh, and then there was the work print, <clears throat> which had no narration, the dream sequence, plus a couple extra scenes. There were these girls, dancing girls with hockey, Jason Voorhees, like hockey masks on. The director's cut, and then there, wait, yeah, there was the director's cut that came out in like 92, I think it was 92, uh, that I, I remember 
uh, seeing it at the New Art uh, in Santa Monica. Uh, standing in line wa waiting to see that, see the director's cut of that. Um, and then finally, like I said, which I think it's a combination of everything, keeping the 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 narration out of it, but the the final cut, uh, which is available now. Um, <laughs> too many versions. Hi, Dahlia Love. Welcome to the show. Um, and you have how many of them? Hatter, I have I have two VHS tapes. I have two VHS tapes, some digital copy of it in that briefcase thing. So I have too many of them. I have too many of them. And it's just because it's so so. Sci-fi for me as a kid, I didn't see it in 82. I was way too young. Uh, I think I finally saw Blade Runner in junior high. Um, so I don't know, 14 years old or something like that. And sci-fi for me was not the Blade Runner I was watching. Blade Runner was, like I said, noir. You know, for noir is a whole other level. You know, it's a whole story told in shadows. You know, and here you have these characters where you, you don't sure you're not sure if you can trust them or if they really are good. How have they not made a grainy black and white version? Hatter, <laughs> no. Wait, yeah, you know what? It's funny because you can catch Blade Runner is on HBO Max, so maybe there will be. I don't know the Philip K. Dick version, uh, the Philip K. Dick cut that's going to show up on HBO Max. Uh, no, there shouldn't be any other versions of it, and there shouldn't be. I feel the final cut version of it told the story well enough. And you know, it's funny. I, so I watched it the other day, just getting ready for the show. Cause I, I haven't, I, it's been about a year since I've seen it. I usually watch it. At least, I, I watch it religiously. Um, but uh, I watched it again recently and it still just blows me away. Uh, Ridley Scott's vision, like watching the film, the film is beautiful. The effects are beautiful. Uh, they fix, they fix. There's a, <laughs> if you watch Blade Runner, there's a scene stunt double breaking through these planes of glass into a building uh, while getting shot. And you could always see, you know, a really, it was always a really bad wig and it was clearly not a Joanne Cassidy. Uh, so they, in, in this, the, the final cut, they digitally put on Joanna Cassidy's face. So it actually looks better. Um, but the whole film is just amazing. The story is really good. And what's so interesting about it is yeah, it's your basic, like, you know, you have your so-called super cop who's been brought out of retirement for, like, one last job to get these uh, replicants, these Nexus 6 replicants, who basically uh, hijacked the shuttle, killed a bunch of people, trying to get back to Earth for one purpose, uh, is they want to know, they want to, they want to survive. They want, you know, uh, replicants they put a fail safe into them where basically they only have a four year lifespan, a, a four year lifespan because what worried it is after a while they started getting their own emotional responses. They started to be even more human. And so they put a four year lifespan on. Them. So after four years, they just die. So these, I think it was supposed to be six replicants. Two of them died uh, when they tried to first to storm the Tyrell corporation. And then the other four are who we see in the movie. Uh, they just want to be able to live their life, to have a life, you know, um, and that's what they're trying to do as brutal as it was. And the reason, um, the reason why I started with the, uh, the closing lines of Roy Blatty, um, he's the, the final replicant, uh, towards the end is when I first saw it, when I saw that scene, so there's this huge fight between Harrison Ford and Roy. It's like a <clears throat> Harrison Ford just killed Roy's love interest, I guess, replicant. And it's this huge fight. It's life and death. And clearly Roy was going to win. Uh, Harrison Ford's character is like hanging over the side. And just as Harrison Ford's about to let go and fall to his death, Roy grabs him and brings him to safety and says those lines and then just dies. So he knew how important life was. And that's why he saved him. Even somebody that was trying to kill him. I mean, that that's, that's some heavy, <laughs> that's some heavy stuff right there, you know? So say what you will about Blade Runner, about the film. 
it, it, it's two hours long. It's slow. It's not an action film. It's not an action film, and it's not. It looks. It looks better than a sci-fi film, but it is a sci-fi film. But it looks amazing. But it's definitely one of those films that you savor. You you know you watch and you savor it. Now, <laughs> that being said, they made a second film, Blade Runner twenty forty nine. I'm not going to talk about that film. I saw it once. I didn't care for it. What I am going to discuss is the fact that what I thought was really interesting, what was so good about Blade Runner, and what a lot of people liked it, what made it a cult film, was that Harrison Ford was a Blade Runner hunting replicants. Was Harrison Ford a replicant as well? So that was what you got to think about. That's what blew my mind. And let me tell you why. So replicants for me i mean i'm just gonna tell you right away i think he was a replicant whatever the second film gave us whatever that that <laughs> but his eye was pink wait <laughs> daddy love what are you talking about oh yeah 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 the the, the reflection in the eyes yeah, yeah that's what i'm gonna get to so regardless of whatever the se second film i'm not even gonna discuss it i'm not even thinking about it um so first things first uh, one of the replicants was trying to, after he was, replicants had pink eye. <laughs> um, one of the replicants uh, was working in the Tyrell Corporation. Tyrell Corporation are the people that made them and was working there, infiltrated there to work there to get closer to Tyrell. But he gets cop, copped. <laughs> he gets caught by a cop, a Blade Runner, who he and, and he actually ends up killing the Blade Runner. But he's trying to go back to his apartment because he wants photos. You know, and Roy Blatty makes a joke saying, like, did you get your precious photos? So these photographs, see, each replicant is given memories. That makes them more susceptible to be controlled by having memories. Um, and a lot of time, uh, they had photographs, and these photographs were very important to them. Harrison Ford has all these photos. He's looking at these photos. Clearly, they mean something to him. Um he has, when you watch the film, replicants, their eyes glow in certain, it's almost like cat eyes at night. You know, their eyes glow. Harrison Ford's, his eyes, you see that happen. Uh, I think it's only one scene. It might only just be one scene. But you see his eyes glow. You know, uh, Edward James Olmos is, is in the film. He plays one of the Blade Runners as well. Maybe a Blade Runner or just a cop. I'm not sure. He makes these little origami figures. Harrison Ford has a dream uh, about a unicorn, okay? Has a dream of this unicorn running. Uh, he dreamed of music, all this stuff like that. This, <laughs> Edward James Olmo makes a unicorn out of origami. He's always making these origami things. This is found in Deckard's apartment. Like, clearly he knows. It's the same way that Deckard knew uh, about Sean Young, Rachel, her character about uh, different things about her, you know, about a baby spider. He says, like, the baby spider that you watched all summer, and then uh, it built a, a, a web and it laid an egg, and then the hundreds of baby spiders came out and killed them up, whatever. Like, Harrison Ford knew that. So it's there. I don't know. I'll have to rewatch. I don't know if I'm going to rewatch the, the second movie. I don't know why they deviated from that. I, they never really needed to make a second one. Blade Runner was a standalone film. Clearly, it was just for money. Um, but yeah, so Blade Runner, Deckard's a replicant. If I'm wrong, if you're watching this on YouTube, put it in the comment. Or if you're listening right now, put it in the chat. Tell me I'm wrong. Tell me why. And don't say because the second movie, blah, blah, blah. Don't say that. But give me a reason why he's not, because he clearly is. And that what makes the film even more interesting is he's killing his own kind. You know, this is just like a bounty hunter would be killing humans, you know, killing other humans. You know, he's killing his own kind. Um, what makes him different? Why is he, you know, the Blade Runner? So it, it's all of this is just so crazy. Um, and that's what makes this film so good. Uh, but yeah, please let me know in the comments because I am would love to hear another reason why maybe he's not. Um, but. Wow. Okay, so that was a lot of information about Blade Runner. Uh, like I said, Future Noir, The Making of Blade Runner, if you can find it, I definitely recommend it. Uh, see if you could find uh, the reprint of the 1982 Cinefix magazine. 
Cinefex, RIP, rest in peace. After 40 years, that magazine, it was the only magazine for like special effects artists. Um, is finally, I think it, the last issue of it came out like two months ago. So Cinefex magazine is no more, which is totally sad. Um, but if you can find that, it's the best, it's the best uh, kind of retrospect about how that film was made. Not even retrospect, it was how the film was made in 1982. There is like a Blade Runner illustration book that goes for like $400 on eBay. Uh, but save yourself the money. Find the reprint of the Cinefex magazine. Uh, that's how we learned anything pre-internet. Hatter, you're right. Cinefex magazine was how we learned anything. Uh, it's really sad that that's gone. Uh, somebody should bring that back. Um, <clears throat> but and it was all it was a pricier magazine, but it was worth it. The, the print quality, everything on it was so good. Um, so, yeah. Um, now, uh, we don't have a lot of time. I was, I have some Funko Pops. So Blade Runner didn't really, as far as merchandise goes, Blade Runner didn't have a lot of merchandise. Uh, Blade Runner kind of, like I said, it didn't do well in the theaters. It was an R rated movie. So it's a little hard, especially in 1982 to make toys for this, for this movie. Uh, Ertl, uh, the company that would make toy cars made cars like this except they, this is plastic i think and uh made of die cast metal uh i think it was like a four pack of cars or you can buy them single i remember having like deckard's car when i was a kid um not knowing what it was no i i eventually when did i see it because i did have that toy car i did have that car but anyway so there wasn't a lot of merchandise for it i i did see on ebay uh that there was a board game a board a blade runner board game in 1982 uh never I never knew they had that. I'll probably never get it because it's a lot of money. Um, I feel like it was like a thousand dollars or something crazy like that. But there was a board game, but there wasn't any ever, uh, other uh, real figures. Uh, model kits. They had some imported Japanese model kits that were really expensive, uh, but are really hard to come by. Uh, the gun. There was like a water gun, and I think this was in Japan. They made a water gun of uh, Deckard's uh, weapon. Uh, that was clearly a water gun. It was even see-through. It was even see-through. Um, but they made a water gun of that. I think you could still pick those up on eBay. Those are expensive also. Um, but there wasn't a lot of toys. There just wasn't a lot of figures for that. Um, so it's really cool when... Here, let me show you these. Then... Uh, <clears throat> so Funko finally brought out from Blade Runner um, these Funko Pops. So this one right here is Rick Deckard. If you flip over to the back, you can see that they have Deckard, they have Rachel, uh, Roy Batty, and Pris. Okay. Now, the Roy Batty, which I'm really excited about, is the one I is, the, is there's two versions of it. There's one of him with the coat, and then there's this one. Now, this is from the scene that I read to you guys at the beginning of the movie. It's Roy, he's just in these little shorts and shoes. He's beat up and he's holding a dove. Like you have to, if you're not going to watch all Blade Runner, just watch that scene. You can find it online. Uh, I think it, you can call it the, uh, I'm trying to remember what the name uh, they were calling the scene. It was um, time to die speech. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what it was. Uh, but, you know, so this is from it. Uh, limited uh, edition Chase. I don't pick up a lot of Funko Pop, so I don't know what Chase means. No idea what I can tell you. Uh, if you collect Funko Pops, then you know what it is. <laughs> Leave, tell me in the comments. Tell me in the chat. Tell me what this is because I don't want to really do the research. I'd rather you just tell me. Um, but yeah, so this is the variant that came out of Roy Batty. You know, um, then there's Pris. Look at, you know, Pris. And it's funny. You'll see she's holding an egg. Um, and there's a couple other ones. I was able to find Rachel and the other version of Roy. They haven't came shown up yet. Um, but I think since we are running out of time, I'm going to actually hold off on opening these uh, for the next show. I apologize. Uh, I didn't expect to talk this much about, you know what I did? I'm not going to lie to you. Um, I did expect to talk this much about Blade Runner. I really like it. It's really a great film. Um, so come back next week, 7.15 on Twitch. Uh, and I'll be unboxing. Hopefully I'll have the other ones as well. And I can unbox all of them. Uh, and it'll be just straight unboxing. No crazy information like what I was giving now. 
Um, so yeah, every Monday, Recovering Collector, 7.15. Wednesdays come back, I'm building that Mustang. I'm building Legos uh, that Lego Creator Mustang. Come check out that out on Fridays. Uh, just draw the damn thing. Uh, the only live drawing game show in Los Angeles. Maybe even in the world. Who knows? Who knows? Um, come see that. Also, I mentioned that. Uh, oops, let's see if I can grab this. I mentioned that we're on YouTube. I'm doing a subscriber giveaway. I'm giving away Bo Katan from The Mandalorian. All you have to do is go to YouTube, subscribe to New Toy Robot. Then go into the chat of the videos that I put up a video and just say subscribe. Let me know who you are. Um, and you could win this. You have until midnight, uh, May 15th, Pacific Standard Time, but you have until May 15th to subscribe to New Toy Robot. I've already got some new subscribers for this. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. But you could win Bo Katan. How cool is that? For free. I'm going to mail it to you for free. You don't even have to pay for shipping. How cool is that? <clears throat> when doves cry. At her. <laughs> now I got that Prince song stuck in my head. <sighs> Always 7.15 on Twitch. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Not so live on YouTube, but you can catch all this there. Also, go to NewToyRobot.com, your one-stop shop for everything New Toy Robot. You can click onto the Twitch feeds to watch your, this show live. You can subscribe actually from there for the YouTube. You can catch the Instagram stuff. And also some other crazy New Toy Robot fun stuff that's been done. Whew. Thank you for sticking with me during this episode. Um, I am Michael Jason Francis. Thank you so much. I feel like I've just been talking the whole time. <laughs> Have a great Monday night, and I will see everybody next week.